Well, hello, Sturgis Missionary Church. As you can see, our sanctuary is pretty empty. But did you know you and I have not lost fellowship? And I'm not referring to watching these videos. Please stay tuned to find out what fellowship is and how God describes it in His Word. together again. I want us to take a look at this idea of fellowship and what it is that God says in his word uh, to help us to better understand what fellowship uh, really uh, is in God's eyes. Because sometimes we tend to use words in uh, such a way that we kind of forget the overarching meaning of what they hold uh, biblically because we kind of put our own twist onto them or the own, our own uh, American kind of mentality to them. So it's important for us to look back at what does God's word have to say about fellowship. The Greek word that's being translated many times as fellowship is koinonia. All right, and so uh, the definitions I'm going to give you and the scriptures we're going to use are ones that reference to that Greek word because we want to know what was the original author communicating to his original audience? How were they supposed to take it? And then we take that information and we apply it to our lives. So the first area we can start is actually outside of the Bible and say, how was the word koinonia used just in general language? And people who have studied this say it's used in a lot of times in reference to um, partnerships of two individuals who own a business. Uh, they were in fellowship. And it's also used in terms of a husband and wife, that they would be in fellowship. And as we look over then to the biblical use of koinonia and this idea of fellowship, we find those same ideas are applied uh, biblically. Just sometimes there's a little bit more added with the God factor. We read in 1 John 1, 3 through 7, a good definition of fellowship. It says, That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you may too have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. This is the message we have from him and proclaim to you. That God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. This verse is telling us we have fellowship if we live our lives according to God's standards. If we choose to live outside of God's standards, then we do not have fellowship. Just like we talked about last week in our message, there is no middle ground. We could think of it as a raft floating out in the ocean, or being dry on the raft represents walking in God's standards. You're either going to be dry or wet, depending on where you're located. If you're hanging onto the raft, floating in the water, then you are wet and therefore not dry. So, if being dry was in fellowship with God, we'd have to say in that case, you weren't in fellowship because you weren't dry. So, that's what the verse is trying to tell us. On if we walk in darkness, outside of God's standards, then we don't have fellowship with Him. But, if we choose to walk according to God's standards, then we will have fellowship with God. This weekend, we have a great illustration of fellowship. We honor those who have served in our armed forces. Our cemeteries are gonna be marked with graves with flags onto them, showing the commonality that some individuals had that passed from this earth. They shared in our armed forces. They have a fellowship with each other that binds them together. So the graves that don't have flags weren't part of the armed forces, but those that do, do. So it's a great visual of what it looks like for fellowship. You're showing us that they have a commonality 
that binds them together. To fully understand fellowship, we must understand fellowship is not about communication or gathering together. The following definition that we'll give of fellowship should help us better understand what God is referring to when he speaks in his word about this idea of fellowship. So what does fellowship mean? How could we define this word? Well, the first definition I'm going to give you is a very simplified version, and then we'll kind of break it down. But we could simplify it by saying fellowship is that which is shared in common. All right, if we want to get a little bit more tech technical and see kind of what does the overflow of this fellowship look like, we could say that it's um, a communal association, all right, the gathering together of people for the mutual benefit of everybody that is involved. All right? That's kind of what overflows from fellowship. Now we have to be careful with this a little bit. Because of our American mind frame, we like to think of fellowship in individualistic terms or community in individualistic terms on the idea that people out of their own free will choose to gather together because of a shared interest. And we have to remember that idea is foreign to uh, the Hebrew mind frame. And so we have to strip fellowship of all the individual aspect of it. I mean, even given the definitions that I did, we can have our minds sometimes tend to go to individualistic idea. When, when I uh, say the phrase, a communal association, I don't know if you're anything like me, but I picture individual people coming together to fellowship. And that's our American mind frame. And it's just, that's not where fellowship is, is coming from. It's the idea that there is this group that has this commonality that has formed. And that is how they are a fellowship. There's no choice really into it. It's a natural occurrence because of what they hold. Just like the people that are in partnership in a business. All right? It's more about what they hold in common uh, than it does about the choice to actually enter into this agreement. So what are the results then of fellowship? Well, it results in gathering. Now, how, no matter how far apart we are, we're still in fellowship. Because fellowship is a shared status, not an interaction. We are united in the Spirit through the work of the Son in relation to the Father. And therefore, we have fellowship with God and fellow believers. God then requires those of us who have fellowship with him to gather together. So as we prepare our hearts to regather as a congregation, it's important for us to think about why it is we want to gather together. If we still have fellowship when we're apart, then what is the benefit of gathering together as a church? The answer can be broken up into two sections, our mutual worship and our brotherly love. So we share a fellowship and we gather together for worship. This is how we are called together corporately, just for the pure aspect of worshiping God because of our commonality that we have with one another, with our faith and our obligations that we have to serve him. We fall under the same rules and regulations. And so one of those things that we do with worship is we gather together to spread the praise and the glory of who God is. And this can be uh, included in the aspect of our singing praises to him, um, sharing testimonies, and other things like that where we gather corporately in order to do those things. We also gather together for corporate prayer, where we lift up each other uh, in prayer. We lift up the work that God is doing. A third one is to hear the oral reading of God's word. We're told that life comes from God's word. It's his word that pierces the bone and marrow. Um, so it's not about always the teaching of what the teacher has to say or even the singing of music. That's a part of why we gather together. But it's actually to hear the words of God so his spirit can speak to us. Another one is for the equipping of the saints for ministry. It's for equipping us for the work that we have to do. Uh, so this would include learning uh, doctrines that are in the Bible, uh, learning the defense of why we believe what we believe and how we know it's true. And 
and the sharing of spiritual gifts and how we can best administer those things. So we gather together to learn those techniques and things. And the last one is to be encouraged and correct ourselves through teaching. So again, sometimes because of how far apart we are from the writings of the scriptures, uh, the culture that they were written in, uh, the geographical situation they're laid in, we sometimes don't always fully understand everything that's being communicated in God's word. And so that's where teaching comes in. Helps us fill in the gaps that we don't uh, fully uh, understand, but also helps us to spearhead the Holy Spirit. So instead of just hearing God's word, we, we meditate on it, we think about it. How does this apply to our lives? And that can bring encouragement to our lives, and sometimes it can bring correction to our lives where we realize we have done something wrong. So here's where we look at Christian living. Uh, we find hope in his word. We find understanding of the scripture. So this list that I just lifted off, listed off doesn't create fellowship, but helps us to stay in fellowship. All right? Remember, fellowship is just a state that we all already have. But we're warned in scriptures that if we don't do these things, we have the uh, possibility of falling in our faith, of lacking in our faith and our trust in God, not fully understanding his word, being overcome by false teachings, and so we are to gather together to help stay strong in those things. So as we have learned over the last uh, few weeks, uh, though gathering together doesn't create fellowship, gathering adds to the experience. We're not made to worship in isolation. We are created with community in mind. The benefits of this community is what we see um, when we look at this classification now of brotherly love. It used to be thought that this was a really harsh environment to try to, to live in. It was a survival of the fittest environment. But recent studies have shown that there's really actually a great example of fellowship uh, here in the forest. See, trees are able to shoot out their roots, uh, sometimes as wide as their canopy, a lot of times twice as wide as what their canopy is. And they go out and they can identify trees of the same species. And then they can make connections with their roots. So what a great example of fellowship. They have connected with trees of their same species. And what's the purpose of that? Because of little trees like this. Well, how is he able to survive in such a harsh environment, competing against all this garlic mustard and other plants that are on this floor, plus the canopy of all these trees? Fighting for sunlight from all these trees, these taller trees and the canopy that they have. So what trees do is they share nutrients with little guys like him that are of the same species and other ones that are of their species that are sick and they give them the vital nutrients that they need that they wouldn't be able to survive with without them. What a great example that is for us of fellowship and that's exactly what God is asking you and I to do as well. So under this idea of brotherly love, we're called to stand together in adversity. We are commanded to encourage one another. We find this in Hebrews 10, 25. Not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encourage one another. And all the more as you see the day drawing near, speaking the end of time. So part of the task of coming together is to encourage one another. Also, to help Christians meet physical needs that aren't due to a fault of their own. And we read of this in Romans 12, 13. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. There are brothers and sisters who are in need, just like we looked at with the trees, that the situation that they are in is overwhelming and they will not be able to prosper given their situation. But those of us that have an abundance, we can come in and share our pool of resources to help them thrive in an environment that is detrimental to them. So they can get their feet underneath them and they can prosper and then be able to do the same thing uh, for somebody else. So that is part of gathering together for the brotherly love aspect. We also help those who are struggling with sins that they're trying to overcome. We see this in Galatians 6.1. Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, 
You who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you be tempted. So we're warned, be careful that you don't fall into the temptation that they have too. But if you're strong, if you're spiritual, if you've overcome this or you don't struggle with it and you have a brother and sister who is trying to overcome a sin in their lives, we're to come alongside them and help them navigate that path. Lastly, we come together for the common good. We're told in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 that uh, we're all in fellowship. Right? We're the body of Christ. But being a body, here's where it works with our American mentality. There's individualism in there. Uh, we're all a piece of the body. And none of us are the whole. And everybody is equally valuable. So we all have different gifting by God because he kind of forces us. It's like the Tower of Babel where uh, they all wanted to congregate in one spot and build the, the tower all the way up to heavens. And God confused their language to force them to have to uh, separate out, to f- uh, multiply and to uh, fill the earth. But we kind of see the opposite in the aspect of our gifting that God gives us. All right, I don't want you to be in isolation. I wanted you to fill the earth, but you're not to just do stuff on your own. And so I'm going to only give you part of what you need. And so you have to rely on other people uh, to be able to fully do everything that I've asked you to do. So you're not going to have every gift that I distribute. So you're going to have to rely on other people. And that's part of coming together as a body of believers. Because for the common good, we share the gifts that we have been given um, by God. So as you'll notice with all these lists that we gave here, none of those things affect fellowship. They're all things that we can do outside of gathering together. But as I mentioned in our um, announcements and update video last week, we can do these things better when we come together corporately because we all know that everybody's going to come together on a certain day of the week and so we can talk to them, so we can encourage them if they need encouragement. We can pray for those who are struggling in certain areas. We can know people that are, are reaching out and saying, I need help here. And so we can uh, be in contact with them the rest of the week. It makes it a little bit easier than trying to call every single person that we are in fellowship with to try to see how they're doing. So gathering together makes this easier, but it's not a necessity. Uh, but we want to be doing that. So as we look at, we're going to be gathering back together as a church As we say, you know, I I miss the fellowship. What do we really mean by saying we miss the fellowship? Are we missing these pieces that God says is what true fellowship is and the overflow of fellowship? Or are we missing something that's actually a little bit more selfish? This is a great time for us to reconnect with the Lord. So how do we put this into practice? I want to give this last illustration. When we have a problem with a piece of technology... The first thing we usually do is reboot it. We shut it down and we unplug it for a while. And then, after a couple minutes, we'll plug it back in. And usually, if it's a minor issue, it'll solve the issue of the problems that we were having. I think God may be rebooting his church. He's unplugged our Sunday morning worship times. And now he's about ready to start them back up again. The question for you and I is, are we going to be the same as we were?